When it comes to the Second World War, most of us already know about the major players like the Soviets and the Japanese in Asia and the Germans kicking it all off in Europe, as well as of course that Dutch ship that pretended to be an island to avoid detection by the Japanese. But in today's video, I want to look at another of those smaller countries that we don't normally consider when we talk about the Second World War. And the one I want to talk about today is the country of Thailand. Because Thailand has a very interesting history when it comes to the Second World War that most people don't know about. We should start in 1932 when the reigning monarchy was overthrown during the Siamese Revolution, entering centuries of monarchy in the country. A leader of the revolution, Major General Plag Phibun Song Kram, eventually came to power and in 1938 overthrew the civilian government and installed a military dictatorship. He decided to rename the kingdom from Siam to Thai, the Thais being the largest ethnic group inside the country, and he t decided to try and create just one homogenous national identity based on the Thai culture whilst repressing other ethnic minorities and at the same time proposing an irredentist claim to try and retake areas outside of the country's current borders that had Thai ethnic minorities or had once been a part of the greater kingdom of Thailand. Now, if you think that this focus on ethnicity and trying to create national unity through a fascist framework and to reclaim lands that had previously been lost, this does sound a little bit familiar to another key player in the Second World War. And of course, I'm on about Imperial Japan. Fibun Songkram pursued a closer relationship with Imperial Japan at the time, which itself was trying to forge a larger empire and to fight against colonial powers in the rest of Asia. This was something that was particularly attractive for Thailand with its irredentist claims against the like of French Indochina and the Japanese presence throughout the Pacific even before their largest extent of conquest could certainly be felt by 1938. A year earlier, in 1937, they had declared war against the Chinese Republic, starting a full-scale war following the Marco Polo Bridge incident and after the 1931 occupation of the northern province of Manchuria. This would be the longest fought and one of the bloodiest theatres of war during the whole Second World War, and it started in 1937, two years earlier than the German and Soviet invasion of Poland in 1939, which is often cited in Europe at least as being the start of the war. But we don't really hear much about this conflict. However, if you go over to today's video sponsor, which is Magellan TV, and check out a documentary that I particularly like called World War II, China's Forgotten War, you can find out an awful lot more about this conflict because it's such a central part of the Second World War, certainly in Asia, but also in the global war as this battle involved millions of people from China, from Japan, and further throughout Asia that were pulled into this conflict, and yet we don't really hear too much about it. What I really like about this documentary is that it's actually a gentleman who goes over an Oxford professor to China and wants to talk to the last survivors who witnessed the war because we're coming to the point where the generation is almost completely gone now that actually saw the war in China. But he is still there talking to people in their 90s and even some people that are around 100 years old trying to discuss the war and what they witnessed. So it's a really great watch for those eyewitness accounts as well as to find out more about the course of the war in China. If you go to the description below or type in try.magellantv.com slash history with Hilbert, you can find this excellent documentary documentary as well as many others on history and anything else that you find interesting. While the Japanese Imperial Army was fighting its way through China, the Thai Army was itself arming, modernizing and preparing to take on its powerful neighbor to the north and east. This was of course French Indochina and several decades earlier, before the Siamese Revolution, the French had fought a war against the Kingdom of Siam and taken several provinces and incorporated it into its colonial holdings. One of the reasons for the Thai alliance with the Japanese, or the Thai cooperation with the Japanese rather, was that the like of the British and the Americans with their own sizable colonial holdings didn't want to seem to be working with a nation that was going against another colonial power, that being the French. And so the Thai army prepared itself to invade, and in 1940 they did just that in the Franco-Thai War. 
Now, because I have a lot to cover in this video, if you are interested in finding out more about the Franco Thai War, you can click on the card or go to the description below and find out about it in my video, which I did on the Franco Thai War. But by 1941, the Thais had been very successful, defeating the underpowered French colonial army and had taken around 54,000 kilometers squared of soil from the French. Part of this was due to the democratic help they received from the Japanese who helped in mediating a peace negotiation with the French and using their military clout to force the acceptance on the French Indochinese. Part of this as well was because the Japanese hoped that they could draw the ties into the war to help them in their wars in China, but particularly also elsewhere. However, the ties were not interested and they had simply seen the war against the French as an irredentist war to reclaim territory that had been lost to the French in times gone by and they continued to pursue a neutral path, not deciding to side with the British and the other allies or the Japanese themselves. Meanwhile, the Japanese continued their advance, fighting against the British and several other colonial powers in the region. The Japanese in particular were interested in Thailand because they wanted to use it as a stepping off board to attack various British possessions. To the south they wanted to attack British Malaya and to the east they wanted to attack British Burma, sometimes also now called Myanmar, and possibly also to launch into British India should they be successful there. But they couldn't do this without stationing forces in Thailand, which is why they needed the Thais to accept them as allies, but preferably also to use Thai manpower and equipment and supplies in order to launch their forces to attack the British there. On the 7th of December 1941, at 11 o'clock in the evening, the Japanese sent the Thai government an ultimatum. Either you allow us to station our forces in Thailand from which we will attack these British colonies, or we will invade. They gave them two hours to answer, and upon hearing no reply, on the 8th of December 1941, Japanese forces crossed over the border and attacked Thailand. They attacked in two main locations. As I already mentioned in my video on the franco thai War, the Japanese would also install garrisons in French Indochina. So part of the invasion came across the border by the Japanese Imperial Army over land. Another part, however, an important part for the Japanese came by sea and involved se several amphibious landings from the Gulf of Thailand with which they would attack the Thin Kra Isthmus from which they could then move forward and attack the British in Malaya and further in Singapore. Japanese troops engaged the Thais for several hours, eventually pushing them back, at which point the Thai government agreed to the Japanese ultimatum and became allies officially with the Japanese. What's interesting is that at the same time, the British actually considered seeing what was happening in Thailand. They thought this was a possibility and they concocted Operation Matador, which was a plan to invade Thailand to preempt this from occurring. However, this was eventually turned down as an unreasonable invasion of a neutral country and something that would be hard to pull off given the state of affairs with the Thai army. However, they did agree to a reduced version of this plan, Operation Krokol, which was carried out on the 8th of December 1941 by several Punjabi regiments that came north from Malaya and entered into southern Thailand to try and take over. However, they were held back by the Thai police force. Surprisingly, the Royal Thai police were able to hold them off while they were at the same time dealing with the Japanese coastal landings further up and eventually when they had agreed this armistice with the Japanese on that same day after several hours of fighting the Japanese also helped in pushing back the British forces who were defeated and retreated into Malaya. On the 25th of January 1942 the Thai government declared war on the United Kingdom as well as on the United States although a rumor says that the actual delegate of the Thai government in New York didn't actually go and inform the United States that they were at war because he refused to do so, although how true this is, I am not sure. The Thai government was now working together with the Japanese in their plans to attack the other British colonies in the area, and part of this involved the Thai army assisting the Japanese as they pushed into British Malaya over the Kra Isthmus. 
They also helped the Japanese in building the Burma Railway, which went right the way through Thailand and into Burma to the west, and which involved the labor of many native people, most of them taken from areas the Japanese had conquered, including many allied prisoners of war who were treated in an incredibly brutal fashion, and many of whom would not survive the harsh treatment and terrible working conditions. It's as part of this railway that the famous bridge over the river Kwai was constructed, this serving as the inspiration and the name for a novel by French author Pierre Boulle, as well as a film from 1957, which is quite entertaining. As part of the Japanese Thai alliance, the Thai army, also known as the Payap army, would end up invading parts of Burma, specifically the Shan provinces in that country, as part of its campaign against the British. And on the 10th of May 1942, they also engaged nationalist Chinese forces who had come down from southern China in an attempt to help their allies, the British, hold off the Japanese in the Burma offensive. They were very successful at fighting against these Chinese nationalist forces and with nowhere to retreat, many of the Chinese surrendered to Thai forces, boosting morale greatly at home. However, in 1942, there was severe flooding in and around Bangkok and other areas of Thailand, inundating large areas of rice paddy cultivation and leading to food shortages of that surplus food. This did actually inadvertently lead to a good thing because it meant that people had to rely much more on noodles for their sustenance. And this led to the creation of, well, some say it was created at this point and others say that actually it had been created earlier in the 1930s, but I'm gonna tell you anyway, and that is that it led to the creation of the famous Pad Thai dish with the noodles because they no longer had the rice to live off because these fields had been flooded. However, by 1943, the war was taking a turn for the worse for the Thai people for a number of reasons. One was that they had actually pushed into China to aid Japanese soldiers there, but they had faced stiff resistance from the Chinese nationalist forces who had held their ground and pushed the Thai army back. The Thai people at home, who had an occupying force of over 100,000 Japanese stationed there, were growing more and more disillusioned and tired of the way that the Japanese were treating the Thai people because they saw them not really as allied but treated them more like a conquered people, often taking far too many liberties with them and reducing the amount that they could trade. There was also the fact that now that they were at war with the United Kingdom and the United States, they could no longer import all the things that they once were able to import when they were neutral. And finally, Bangkok had been bombed by a lot of Allied aircraft as the war had been going on. And this was leading to loss of life, industry and security. Furthermore, the Thai people were growing weary of the war as the news of Japanese successes slowly started to seem more and more far-fetched as they were losing ground to the like of the Americans and the British. However, they continued to propose that they were actually gaining ground as part of their propaganda, although evidently this was not the case. And so it was that the Thai government actually tried to distance itself somewhat from the Japanese and even started to conclude in secret talks with the British about what would happen when the Japanese were finally ousted. Bibun Song Kram decided to release several of the Chinese prisoners that they had taken in the previous years in order to smooth over some of the relations with the Chinese. He also was distancing himself from the Japanese administration and announced that he would move the capital of Thailand from Bangkok to the more northern Pet Chabon, which was a very risky move considering that this was actually really in a backwater, it was in the middle of the mountains and was close to where most of the Thai army forces were stationed and so this clearly was him trying to secure his position in case things went south with the Japanese and it was possibly a location from which he could start a fight against the Japanese. Part of this led to the nickname of Thailand becoming known both by the Japanese, uh, the Germans, as well as by several of the allied nations. They called Thailand Oriental Italy because just as like what happened in 1943 with Benito Mussolini and Italy suing for peace with the allies, it seemed that Thailand was going the same way. They had really lost the stomach 
to fight, they saw which way the wind was blowing, and they had always been half-hearted partners of the Japanese to begin with. By 1944, the Japanese also realized that something was afoot with the way that Pibun Song Kram and other members of the Thai government were acting, and so they placed them under close watch, although initially they didn't do anything that warranted for their arrest or removal. In fact, his downfall would come from another Thai member of the government. This was Pridi Banomyong, and he had been an advocate of distancing from the Japanese from the very start already in 1940. He didn't want to ensure closer relations with Japan and had secretly actually been while he was a member of the Thai government at the same time he from 1941 was leading the FTM or the Free Thai Movement a resistance movement that had been in touch with the Allies and was arming tens of thousands of guerrillas to fight against the Japanese in the mountainous north of Thailand and possibly also to lead them in a revolt against them. Now what's interesting is that by 1944 they were indeed preparing for just this. They were also in touch with several allied commands and had British special forces working with them and had many of the Thai police working in their service as well. By 1945, they had indeed laid the groundworks for a rising against the Japanese to coincide with the British pushing them back out of Myanmar and from other areas in the Pacific as well. The Thai army was also on board and so they prepared to capture key installations with the police forces to arrest figures high up in the Japanese chain of command before sending the army in to disarm Japanese soldiers. They prepared fortifications by disguising them as air raid shelters and were also aware that the Japanese were preparing for a long defense of Thailand as the Allies were sweeping them back further in the west. In the end, this wasn't necessary as on the 6th of August and also three days later, two atomic bombs were dropped on Japan and Japan promptly capitulated. However, as soon as this happened, Pridi even acknowledged that he had never been in favor of agreeing with the Japanese and that the alliance with Japan had been thrust on the Thai government under duress. The Thai army immediately surrounded the Japanese in their bases and demanded that they hand over their weapons although the Japanese commander-in-chief in Thailand refused to do so until the Allies had arrived. The first Allied forces to arrive were British Indian soldiers, although soon the country was occupied by the Americans. The Americans, as a thanks to the creation of the FTM, the Free Thai Movement, which had strong links with Washington and fighting against the Japanese there, didn't view Thailand as being an enemy captured nation as it did with several of the other powers such as Germany and Japan that it took over, instead seeing Thailand as an occupied nation that the Japanese had taken over themselves and so treated them more leniently. The British, on the other hand, would not take it so simply, of course, because the Thais had helped the Japanese to invade several of their colonial possessions and only agreed a ceasefire with the Thai government after they had sent rice over to British Malaya as compensation. The French, for many of the same reasons, also didn't want the Thais to be let off so easily and therefore blocked the entry of Thailand into the UN until Thailand had ceded back those provinces that they had taken from the French in the Franco-Thai War. Of course, they didn't really have too long a memory because then they would have known that the French East Indies themselves had actually retaken those provinces from the former Kingdom of Siam. But that's international politics for you. In any case, I think that the role of Thailand during the Second World War was incredibly interesting. I think they are the reluctant Axis power of Asia, and for better or worse, this is how they came out of the war. I hope you have found this one interesting as well because I certainly came across some of this information for the first time when I was researching my video on the Franco-Thai War that I made oh, about a year ago now, but I'm glad that I've come back to take a look at it in this unknown World War II series. Do let me know in the comments below if you enjoyed watching this one, I certainly enjoyed making it and researching it, and which country you would like to see me talk about next when it comes to the Second World War for those countries that we don't normally talk about during this period.
I've got a list that I already think would be interesting. I certainly will have one coming out about Iceland because I did one on the Faroe Islands a little while back already as well, which I think would be very interesting. But do let me know in the comments below which one you would like to see and whether you think that Thailand should have got off from the war so easily as opposed to other nations which were treated much more harshly or whether they were indeed simply the victims of their situation with the Japanese invasion and strong neighbours. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. I have been Hilbert and this has been The History.